Shalom. Today's main news stories concern an Israeli preparedness for a possible war with Syria, the current unrest in Gaza, and a literal wave of refugees from Darfur, southern Sudan, and Eritrea pouring into Israel across the Egyptian border. Israel Vision Review will give you a biblical perspective and it will follow the IBA news. Good evening and welcome to IBA News coming to you from Jerusalem. Drama outside the Knesset ended a short time ago. After a three-hour standoff, a single mother left her car after threatening to kill herself. Knesset Director General Avi Balishnikov eventually talked the woman out of the car, and she is currently in his Knesset office. Earlier, the woman, identified as Sima Rave, claimed to have a gas canister and a knife in the vehicle. Rave said that she was protesting the government's neglect of her two severely disabled children and claimed that welfare ministry officials were unwilling to even hear her name. According to welfare officials, just recently, her children received new electric wheelchairs, costing some 30,000 shekels. The largest ever home front drill in Israel's history kicked off today with a special cabinet session held in the Knesset. Joining us with details is IBA's diplomatic correspondent, Leah Zinder. Leah? Yes, hi, Laura. As you say, the cabinet did meet in the Knesset today to formally kick off the drill, which has been named Turning Point 2. Deputy Defense Minister Matan Vilnai briefed the cabinet on details of the drill, which will include the testing of sirens across the nation on Tuesday at 10 a.m., so be warned about that. Prime Minister Omar opened the cabinet meeting with a conciliatory and reassuring message for Syrian President Bashar Assad in view of the drill. He said the state of Israel is not seeking violent confrontation in the north and he added we've said more than once we have an interest in negotiating peace with Syria if the right conditions develop we will seize the opportunity defense minister Barak said just before the cabinet meeting that while the army remains intensely vigilant on the northern border Israel has no interest in escalating the situation in the north the other side knows this Barak said and in our estimation they too have no interest in escalation during the cabinet meeting Barak said the preparedness of the home front is a critical component of victory on the battlefield. And let's all hope, Laura, that this all remains a virtual battle. Laura. Leah, did any other important issues come up at today's cabinet meeting? Yes, actually they did. A senior defense source briefed the cabinet on the situation in Gaza, and the news on that front is not very reassuring. Uh, the source told IBA News that uh, weapons continue to flow into the Gaza Strip and Hamas is preparing for another round of hostilities against Israel. Also, uh, my last point today, uh, at today's meeting, um, Internal Security Minister Avi Dichter was very angry. We all remember that he closely escaped being hit by a Palestinian sniper near the Gaza border on Friday. Dichter said today, we are involved in a war of attrition in Gaza. He said the cabinet told the army two weeks ago to stop the rocket fire from Gaza. This hasn't happened and yet we continue to to make concessions to the Palestinians. And finally, back to the north, and let's hear what Deputy Defense Minister Matan Vilnai had to say about the drill. There is nothing dangerous in this exercise. It's exercise only of the Home Front Command. It's not in the front. It's only to be ready if they will start something, and that's it. Thank you. Thank back you, to you in the studio, Laura. Thanks, Leah. Fearing some kind of Hezbollah reaction to the Israeli emergency drill, United Nations peacekeepers in southern Lebanon today intensified patrols along the northern border. Lebanese troops in the area were put on alert, and Lebanese President Fuad Senora ordered the Lebanese army to take necessary precautions to watch for any Israeli violation of Lebanese sovereignty. Israel has sent assurances to the United Nations that no IDF forces have been mobilized for deployment in the northern border area, and reservists have not been called up. If Israel does not meet our demands, we will be negotiating over the bones of Gilad Shalit. That was the word today from senior Hamas official Musa Abu Marzouk in an interview with the Kuwaiti al Qabas newspaper. The terror group is demanding the release of 350 Palestinian security prisoners from Israeli jails as a first step in negotiation for Shalit's release. This is the first time Hamas has threatened to kill Shalit, who has been in captivity since June of 2006. 
Details of Israel's attack on a Syrian nuclear facility last year may soon be made public. Yochanan El Ram has that story. The government of Prime Minister Ehud Olmert and the Bush administration are coordinating the release of information on an airstrike conducted by the IAF on a Syrian target this past September. Foreign reports claim the site was a nuclear facility being built with North Korean aid. According to Haaretz, the details will be revealed during congressional hearings held by the House Intelligence Committee later this month. Several congressmen have threatened not to give American intelligence agencies their requested budgets unless they reveal details of the attack and the nuclear partnership between Syria and North Korea. The Israeli defense establishment is opposed to making the information public and has asked that the congressional hearing be a closed session. According to Haaretz, advisors to Olmert discussed the issue with senior U.S. officials in Washington last week. Some in the Israeli and American political establishments believe publicizing details of the attack may pressure Damascus to distance itself from Iran and North Korea. Others have hinted that releasing the information may help boost the ratings of Prime Minister Omer. And still others express concern that it could push Syrian President Bashar al-Assad to order a face-saving revenge attack that could lead to a wider conflagration. Yohanan El Rom for IBA News. And staying with Syria, the head of Syrian military intelligence, Major General Asif Shalkat, has been placed under house arrest in connection with the assassination of Hezbollah terror chief Imad Mounia. This according to former Syrian Vice President Abdel Khalim Kadam, who told the Lebanese newspaper Al Mustakbal that the arrest was made after Shalkat claimed that the probe he was conducting into Mounia's killing in Damascus showed that the assassins came from Syria. According to Kadam, the investigation was given over to a cousin of President Assad, Hafez Makhlouf. Saddam also claimed that Syria's attempts to place the blame for the killing on Arab intelligence services were stupid and naive. Officials in Syria have indicated that the results of the probe into the Mounia assassination would be released today. Former Vice President Saddam was expelled from Syria in 2005 after he criticized Assad's dealings with Lebanon. Major Hazi Deutsch of the IDF Home Front Command told IBA's Efrat Batat that the upcoming exercise has been planned for a long time and has no connection to current tensions on the northern border. What will happen is a number of things. We're going to have an exercise that includes uh, both tabletop drills uh, within the government, the municipal government, the uh, national level government ministries, and obviously the Home Front Command, the national police, uh, MADA, and uh, the fire department. In addition, there will be uh, field exercises uh, out in the different cities throughout the country, which will uh, simulate the different threats that uh, we may deal with in a crisis situation, uh, including the use of uh, conventional and the use of non-conventional weapons, uh, a hazardous material event, um, accident, uh, and an exercise uh, in a hospital, in the Afula Hospital, uh, including uh, military units, medical units from the Home Front Command, which will support the civilian uh, medical units who are operating. You mentioned some of the possible scenarios. Uh, what is the biggest threat that will be examined? Is it a massive missile strike on the country's uh, population centers? The, the idea of the exercise is to examine all of the, the threat scenarios that we may have to deal with in a crisis. It's not necessarily uh, one scenario more than the other. The main idea is to have us exercise the interagency cooperation between the different uh, organizations involved from the governmental level, uh, the Ministry of Defense, the newly formed uh, Rachel, the uh, Emergency Management Agency, uh, obviously the Home Front Command itself and its military units, uh, the Israeli National Police, the municipal governments uh, in the different uh, cities and, and uh, local areas, including uh, we now have, uh, as a lesson from the Second Lebanese War, uh, Home Front Command liaison uh, officers to the municipal governments. And this will be a, an opportunity to exercise the connection and the work together of the municipal government and the uh, liaison officers. And as I said, the first time that we'll have an opportunity to exercise the uh, Rachel, the emergency management agency that has been formed as a lesson from the second of Now, what war. should the ordinary citizen, what should people do when they hear the sirens, the alarm that will be sounded off on Tuesday at 10 a.m. in the morning? Okay. First of all, it is uh, important uh, that we mention that there will be a siren throughout the entire country, uh, with the exception 
of uh, the Gaza Strip area. They unfortunately have sirens enough uh, without this exercise. This is on Tuesday at 10 a.m. Yes, this is uh, on the 8th right, uh, at 10 a.m. Tuesday, yes. Uh, First of all, within uh, the schools, there will be exercises uh, in coordination between the Home Front Command and the Ministry of Education. There will be instructions given to the staff in the schools and in the kindergartens, uh, both by the Home Front Command soldiers and by uh, the Ministry of Education. Uh, and the children will be required to, to go into the protected space and the staff in the school will give them different things to do. Uh, again, to make sure that the children uh, understand and are prepared in case of an emergency. Uh, the civilian population, uh, they're not required to do anything, although we do request that uh, we take this uh, chance, this opportunity, uh, to make sure that uh, we know in our home and in our place of uh, business where the nearest uh, protected space is so that we can be prepared in, uh, for a time of emergency if it will, anything will happen. We're now joined in the studio by strategic affairs expert Hirsch Goodman of the Gloria Center for National Security no, Studies. No, I'm not actually, but I'm from the Institute for National Security. Institute Security. for National Securities. Um, just a civil defense exercise inside Israel. Why all the concern in Syria and Lebanon? I don't think there's real concern in Syria and Lebanon. I just think that uh, one has to make sure that they understand what it is we're doing. And uh, I think that message was very clearly uh, sent across, and I don't think there's any real concern in either. Is there still a chance, despite assurances by the Prime Minister and the Defence Minister, that the situation in the North could escalate into an armed confrontation with Syria? I don't think uh, there's any scenario I can see right now that would lead to an armed confrontation with Syria. An armed confrontation with Syria is not like a skirmish along the border with Hezbollah or with uh, Hamas. It's, it is a massive war, and the weapons that uh, Syria has prepared for this war are long-range and medium-range rockets, missiles, and that is the reason for today's exercise, that the next war, the battlefield, is going to be Israel's population centers. And it's a massive decision the Syrians have to take if they really want to do that, because then they're writing their own uh, very heavy punishment. The Syrian president and his army has been rearming very rapidly. Does that indicate an interest in an armed confrontation with Israel? It indicates an interest in, uh, in self-survival. Every country needs to deal with its own defense. The Syrians have neglected their armed forces for many, many, many years. I don't think they're investing very much in their, um, in their ground forces. I don't think they're investing very much in, uh, in, in their air force. I think they're investing very heavily in defense, and I think they're investing very heavily in missiles. Hirsch, the U.S. Congress is set to hold hearings on the alleged Israel attack on a Syrian nuclear facility last year. Do you expect the details of that attack, which Israel hasn't ever commented on publicly, will be revealed at those hearings? Uh, if they hold the hearings in camera, they have less chance of being revealed. I wouldn't say they won't be revealed because, you know, there's a lot of people involved here. But you have to understand the context of, the, of this uh, congressional move. It's, it's one of the great achievements, one of the only achievements of the Bush administration has been to get North Korea to limit its own nuclear program and to stop exporting its nuclear program. And if they can show that despite the Bush achievement, North Korea went ahead and supplied Syria with nuclear uh, technology anyway, it'll be a huge embarrassment to this administration. If indeed information does emerge at those hearings about the reported strike, is this a positive thing from Israel's point of view? Yeah, I think uh, I think it's a very good thing from Israeli deterrence that the other side knows we've got brilliant intelligence and we've got a capability of attacking uh, in a stealthful way that took everyone by surprise. Hirsch Goodman, strategic expert at the Institute for National Security Studies. Thanks so much for being with us on IBA. My, my pleasure. Prime Minister Ehud Olmert recently ordered the use of reasonable force as he instructed security services in the south to locate and stop what he called a tsunami of African infiltrators. Meanwhile, Tel Aviv Deputy Mayor Yael Dayan said her city is considering the erection of a tent city for some 700 homeless refugees from Darfur, southern Sudan, and Eritrea. We get more on this report from Aaron Viner. Six to 7,000 asylum seekers from southern Sudan, Eritrea, and Darfur have entered Israel over the past two years, the majority of them illegally. 
Officials estimate that close to 3,000 people, including women and children, have made their way across Israel's porous Sinai border with Egypt over the past three months alone. Israel has no comprehensive policy to effectively deal with the infiltration. While close to 1,000 refugees are now detained in the Negev Ketziot prison, others have been housed in border kibbutzim, hotels, shelters, and private homes. Others are in hiding. Tel Aviv Deputy Mayor Yael Dayan has proposed erecting a tent city for some six to 700 people now living in abysmal conditions. Many have serious health problems, and volunteer organizations are struggling to meet even the most basic of needs. The clinic right now is closed. Most of the refugees claim that they face death if deported out of Israel. If the Egyptian didn't kill us, they will give us to the government of Sudan. So we face the same thing. I want you to tell the government why not to kill us here and finish. Last summer, the government granted temporary resident status to 500 refugees from the genocidal fields of Darfur, ordering the expulsion to Egypt of the remaining thousands. Israeli deportations ended when Egypt violated its promise not to expel the refugees back to Sudan. At least 11 refugees were killed by Egyptian troops after Israel demanded Egypt better police its borders, including one death just days ago. Last week, Prime Minister Ehud Olmert ordered Israeli security services to stem the human flood with what he called reasonable force. Olmert also proposed deporting the refugees to third-party nations, preferably African. As an emergency measure, the Interior Ministry allowed some 130 fortunate Eritrean refugees living in Tel Aviv to be bused to a lot this week, where most received work permits for employment in the hotel industry. The move wasn't entirely successful, and several were returned to Tel Aviv after nightfall and turned away from shelters filled to capacity. In the meantime, the country verges on the edge of a dire humanitarian crisis without a cohesive plan to tackle the growing problem. This is Aaron Viner for IBA News. Well, snow fell in London today for the Olympic torch relay through the English capital. Some 2,000 police officers were on duty protecting the Olympic flame as it was carried on a 31-mile journey from Wembley Stadium to Greenwich. Several torchbearers dropped out of the rally to protest China's occupation of Tibet. A small group of demonstrators tried to disrupt the ceremony and clashed with police. Three protesters were arrested outside Wembley Stadium. The 2008 Olympic Summer Games take place in Beijing from August 8th through the 24th, and the next Summer Games are in London in 2012. Screen legend Charlton Heston is dead. The 84-year-old Oscar-winning actor died at home last night with his wife of 64 years, Lydia, by his side. Heston's rugged features and commanding presence won him epic roles portraying historical characters such as Moses, Michelangelo, El Cid, and Ben-Hur, which garnered him the Best Actor Award in 1959. Heston's longtime publicist, Michael Levine, said if Hollywood had a Mount Rushmore, Heston's face would be on it. And he added that the actor's death represented not only the loss of a great actor and human being, but also the end of an era. I will pray that you live. Return. Briefly on local money matters, share prices on the Tel Aviv exchange edged higher on this first day of the trading week. Let's take a look at the closing numbers. And the IBA weather team says it changes in the air. Cloudy and hazy with a chance for isolated light rain showers tonight and tomorrow morning. Temperatures returning to more normal levels. Here are the highs and lows. And that's all for today. We'll be back tomorrow at the same time on the same channel. Until then, thanks for watching. Have a great evening. And shalom from Jerusalem. Concerning the potential escalation of tensions on Israel's northern border with Syria, 
We heard that the Israeli defense minister, Ehud Barak, <clears throat> has said that Israel has no interest in escalating the situation. We know from Isaiah 19 that the promise given over Syria is that there will one day be a highway stretching from Damascus in Syria through Israel down to Egypt. Here's what the Bible says in Isaiah 19, verse 23 to 25. <clears throat> in that day there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian will come into Egypt and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. And in that day Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the land whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, bless saying, Blessed is Egypt my people and Assyria the work of my hands, and Israel my inheritance. Now if Syria will bless Israel, they will be the first to be blessed. If not, they will suffer the consequences. As we see in yet another scripture that talks about Damascus, it could one day become a ruinous heap in Isaiah 17.1. And as with all scripture, it's there for our understanding, our instruction, and our blessing. But it's also a two-edged sword that can divide the bone from the very marrow. So it brings truth to bear on every situation in the world. Now Gaza is in more chaos. Why is it that this beautiful piece of land stretching 20 kilometers along the edge of the blue Mediterranean Sea is in such a mess of anarchy and violence? They have launched more than 5,000 Qassam rockets and larger Grad missiles into southern Israel, causing huge damage. And remember that the Gazan population elected Hamas as their government representatives. Now they have sown to the wind and they are weep, reaping the whirlwind. Because Hamas will not recognize Israel's existence or right to exist, this is foolish. Israel, according to the word of God in Jeremiah, is here to stay. God promised it, and to fight against Israel and her existence is like cutting off your nose to spite your face. It's just a non-starter and will never produce anything. It will only lead to insanity, death, and destruction. Hamas is against Israel and against their own brothers in the Palestinian Authority, against Egypt and the Egyptian militia, and against the UN, and even against their moderate Arab brothers in the surrounding nations. Is this exactly what the Bible says in Genesis 16.12 about Ishmael? It says, He shall be a wild man, his hand shall be against his brothers, and every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the midst of his brethren. Now finally, let's take a look at Israel as a refuge nation. In the Bible, there were six refuge cities that were set up so that anyone fleeing for their life could find refuge and safety and prepare for justification before the judges. This is found in Joshua 23, where it says, Take your refuge from the avenger. Now, the ethnic cleansing of Christians and Muslims by Muslim militia and extremists in South Sudan and Darfur has created an exodus where hundreds of thousands of Sudanese refugees have sought refuge in Egypt. However, two years ago, violence erupted in Cairo in front of the UN headquarters when the Sudanese were uh, staging a, a quiet demonstration and uh, they were, because they were living in squalid conditions and they were protesting, but they were doused with water from water cannons, shot, killed, and all of their identity papers were heaped in a huge pile and burned by the Egyptian police. <clears throat> in response, thousands of Sudanese refugees have fled through the Sinai Desert northward, aided by local Bedouins, and crossed into Israel at the risk of death, not by Israel, but by the Egyptian border guards. Some have been shot in the back as they fled. <clears throat> now one day, I was filming some of these Sudanese refugee women and children in a shelter near Haifa, and the Lord spoke to me, and He said, What are you doing for these beleaguered people? And that was a shock. He said, If everyone would just help one refugee 
the problem could be solved. And that shook me. Then, a few weeks later, Meredith and I met a young family from South Sudan. They had been orphaned as children and escaped slavery. They had a strong Christian faith and we were very impressed. And so Meridale and I, after prayer, decided to adopt this father and mother and child. And we're working with them to help them get to Canada where they can study uh, and, uh, in international relations. And one day they hope to return and help their people in Sudan. They're a very precious family. As we close this portion of Israel Vision Review, let's pray for a quiet on Israel's northern border. Let's pray for a cessation of suffering of innocence, innocent people in Gaza under the violent and chaotic Hamas regime. Let's pray for the fate of Sudanese refugees in Israel. And finally, let's pray for number four, for Israel to have godly leaders who will heed the word of God in the book of books. And we want to leave you with this thought found in the Bible in Matthew chapter 25. If you do this to one of the least of these my brethren, you do it unto me. See you tomorrow. Shalom from Jerusalem.